All right. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, nice to see you back. We made it to 2021. Well, full disclosure, I am in 2031 because I feel like I've aged 10 years in the last 24 hours. Uh, so hello from the future. <laughs> Now, if your New Year's resolution was to learn more, uh, you are in the right place. Uh, welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy, th uh, conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. This is our first uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents for the year, and I'm delighted to be your host. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am a stand-up comedian and author. And if you are so inclined, you can find out more about me and my work at VeryFunnyLady.com. I am also the co-host for Point of Inquiry, the podcast for the Center for Inquiry. And uh, before we get started in earnest, I have a couple of reminders for you. As we continue to wrestle with the pandemic, uh, the Center for uh, Inquiries Coronavirus Resource Center is really doing the work of, of fact checking uh, misinformation and providing reliable um, uh, news sources, which you can avail yourself of at centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. Uh, this week, they've curated some interesting uh, articles about how pandemic shaming can backfire, how uh, Christian nationalism's COVID vaccine doubt is threatening America's herd immunity, and how Britain is really taking a gamble with COVID-19 vaccines, which is upping the stakes for the rest of the world. I also, as always, encourage you to subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Uh, this month's cover, I have it around here somewhere. Hang on. Here we go. This month's cover is Remembering uh, the Amazing Randy. I, I feel very, very fortunate to have worked with him, I met him and worked with him several times. And uh, as a bonus and in this issue, uh, I'm on page 57. Uh, you'll find me uh, in my discussion with Carol Tavris. Uh, we're talking about cognitive dissonance and the pandemic. Now, in case you don't know, there are two ways to subscribe. It's digital and print. And in the print subscription, if you have that, it gives you access to the digital subscription. I know, right? So go to skepticalinquirer.org and hit the subscribe button at the top right of your screen. I'm also going to ask you to go on ahead and mark your calendar for the next uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents, which is on January 21st. And that's featuring Maria Konnikova talking about her book, The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Now, uh, if you have not been here before, I will let you know that the flow of the evening is very easy. You get to keep doing whatever you're doing. You're doing great. And I'll introduce our guest. She'll share, inform, and amaze us and then we'll open it up for your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a little uh, Q&A icon and that's where you type your questions in the form of a question. And I will try to get to as many of them as possible. And please note that if you miss any of this event tonight, it is being recorded and it will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And so everyone, our guest tonight is a PhD scientist, educator, and an active practitioner of science outreach at Rockefeller University, which is committed to providing equitable access and science education across the five boroughs of New York City and beyond. As an educator, she held an adjunct faculty position at Pace University and was a visiting assistant professor at Albany College of Pharmacy. Currently at Rockefeller University, she uses her passion for teaching and mentoring high school students of all backgrounds, but especially those underrepresented in the STEM fields and in ways that foster their love for science and research. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting our guest at Nexus, the Northeast, science, Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism in 2019, where she spoke eloquently, knowledgeably, and passionately about the illusion of, of accessibility in STEM. She pointed out the problems and outlined the solutions. And if I, call, I recall this correctly, uh, she did it while she was nine months pregnant. Please rest assured that if I had so much as a hangnail, y'all would not see me tonight. 
Okay. So speaking with us about disparities in the midst of COVID-19, education, health, and race, please welcome Aldalis Walwyn Pollard. Awesome. Um, hi, you, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that introduction. And it feels great to be here. We made it. Um, past 2020 and you know we're all looking forward to 2021 but some may feel different at this moment in time um, but today I wanted to come to everyone and talk about some of the disparities that we're facing in the midst of COVID-19. A lot of the disparities that we're seeing um, have been present for a very long time and I think the current pandemic has only highlighted that for specific communities, which I'll speak more on. And so I'm Adela Swallow Pollard, like she mentioned, a PhD trained scientist. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Odella Swalwin. Um, I work with the Rock EDU team at the Rockefeller University. You can follow us at, at rockedu underscore. And I just started an Instagram page, Dr. Underscore Odella, to try to um, input and showcase information about science, the pandemic, in a way that's digestible for um, the community, more specifically communities that look just like myself. So I just wanna quickly go over who I am just to lay the foundation as to why I'm so passionate about what I'm gonna talk about today. And also to let you know my biases, right? We all go through life experiencing a number of different things. And a lot of times we live in our bubbles and unless that bubble is popped or we're listening to social media or watching the news, um, we sometimes don't realize the experiences that others have and why they do the things they do. And so, as you can see, I am Black. Um, I actually was not born in the continental US. I am from the United States Virgin Islands. And for those who are not familiar, we're three islands southeast of Puerto Rico. We are US territory. Um, and I was born and raised there. My parents were from another island, St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, neither were college educated, um, and they migrated to US Virgin Islands for a better life. Had me and my sister. It's a small community, about 60,000 people on island, very family friendly environment. And the thing about being born and raised in the US Virgin Islands is that even though I'm black, I didn't really realize that I was black, black. And I'll talk a little bit more as to what that means. Um, I attended public schools, I had a public school education. I went to an HBCU, the University of the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas, and I pursued a bachelor's of science degree in biology. And at that point, I knew I wanted to uh, carry on with my career and education. So I left the tropics and I migrated to the Northeast in Rochester, New York. And that was the first time that I realized that I was indeed a minority. So I went from being one of many, so there are about 78% Black African descent in the US Virgin Islands, to being one of very few and at most times the only. And this is specifically for the field of STEM, which we all know it's pretty much has been ran by white males. But besides that, I continued my effort in my career and I graduated with my PhD in 2015. And here is myself with a couple of my colleagues at a commencement ceremony at the Rockefeller University where I'm currently employed. And so, like I mentioned, I'm black, I'm a woman. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm also married to a black man who was actually born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And so even though we both identify um, and we both are Black people, our experiences have been drastically different. Um, my experience being a Caribbean American and his experience being a Black American born in the continental US. I, like um, we mentioned earlier, I was nine months pregnant at the prior presentation. And so my son, he turned 13, 17 months today. And so I'm also raising a Black son um, in the United States. And there's so many things that we think about when you're raising families, specifically those who are Black and people of color, um, because of the disparities that we face and the inequalities and injustices that we face every day. Um, but I also have uh, another son um, presented to me from, from my husband. He's 20 years old. Don't have a picture here because we, for some reason, can never get a picture with all four of us. But he's a 20-year-old Black male also in the Marines. Um, he's in the Marines right now. And so we always talk about, you know, his life in the military and what his plans are afterwards. And because of my background and my experiences, alongside my husband's experience in New York City, um, my current role at Rocky DU is one that's close to my heart. 
And so I work with bringing in students from underserved communities in the five boroughs of New York City. And I really try my best to expose STEM in a way that's digestible, in a way that's fun and exciting, hopefully to pique their interest, because a lot of times they don't necessarily experience that in the classroom. And so I want to start my presentation by talking about what these disparities are and how do they arise. And so disparities are usually linked to someone's socioeconomic status. And your socioeconomic status can lead to several things. This can affect where you live. And so we know there are affluent communities, most likely some of them are in the suburbs. We have urban communities, we have rural communities. Your socioeconomic status also determines your healthcare access, your health insurance, what type of health insurance you have. And even when you do have health insurance, you have to think about the quality of healthcare that you're going to receive. There's an ongoing joke in New York City. It's not necessarily funny, but they would say, um, if you're all familiar with Manhattan, that if you are injured or something happens, you try your best to get below 96th Street. And so if you're not familiar below 96th Street, you'll find like the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side where you have more affluent majority white communities who have higher incomes and higher socioeconomic status. Once you start to get uptown, you see that the diversity changes where you have majority minoritized communities. And for some reason, um, which I'll point out in my presentation, don't receive um, as good care as they would have in other hospitals in other regions. But your socioeconomic status also determines what and how we eat. I don't know if you've heard the term of a food desert, right? There are a number of communities where there are multitudes of fast food restaurants and there are very little places where you can get fresh produce at a reasonable price. And I think about going to McDonald's and getting something off the dollar menu versus, you know, me when you know I get paid and I want to go to Whole Foods and get dinner and you know all the nice meats and vegetables um, to bring at home and to realize that there are a lot of families who can't afford and don't have the means to do that. And your socioeconomic status also depicts what jobs you have and that play a really big role in a number of things that measures what your socioeconomic status is. And so what are those things? Like how is your socioeconomic status measured. So I've talked about how it can affect you. And one of the biggest players of your socioeconomic status is your income. And so we know people who have higher income usually has better outlooks on life, health, um, and education for their future generations and for their kids. And we even know that in certain racial ethnic groups, even if you have the same degree of education and you work in the same jobs, there are disparities in the amount that they are paid in comparison to their white counterparts. Education, this is one of my passion and we see that education plays a really big role in determining how much money you'll end up making in terms of are you a high school graduate versus do you have a professional or graduate degree? The problem is not everyone is afforded the opportunity for the same type of education. We know that the quality of education drastically changes based on the communities that you live in. And your financial security. So this is kind of related to income, but it's more so thinking about if you were to lose your job today, how many months of income do you have that you can be able to continue living the lifestyle that you're living in? And when we think of financial security, we think of assets and we think of wealth. And finally, it relates to your social status or your social class. So we think about, um, you know, whether or not you're middle class or lower class, but I also want to point out that these are terminologies uh, made from made by um, Americans that we, you know, somehow go by today. And so this social structure has been developed, unfortunately, by majority white people and that could go on and on about, you know, the racial social construct, but I think that's another topic for another day. But all these four things influence your socioeconomic status. So now let's get into some of the data sets. And one of the first figures that I found that I saw that was super drastic uh, was your household income. And we know that income plays a role in your socioeconomic status. So this is a data set that looks at the median household income by race, 
and Hispanic origin. And so this data set was taken from 1967 to 2007. And what it showcased is that out of all of the racial ethnic groups that they looked at, um, we see that Blacks has a median household income of about 40,000 a year. And we see the highest median household income at about 81,000 a year. And this thread has been ongoing since 1967. And even though it's been trending up, uh, we see that we are still receiving, uh, we still have the least amount of household income. And so even with the new data that we have for 2019, this trend remains the same. But even with the disparities in income, an even wider gap that we see is the racial wealth gap that we have here in America. And I, when I saw this, I was, my jaws dropped. Because as I'm showing you, you see that white families have um, a net worth. So basically they're subtracting your assets, um, your debts from your assets. And you see that the wealth in white households is about 170,000 a year. When you look at the wealth for black families, it's not even $20,000 a year. I right, just think about that. A whole, it's a, a over a hundred thousand dollar gap in terms of net worth for Black people, right? And there are many reasons for this. And I also want to point out that there are other ethnic groups that are poor, right? But even when we look at white families that are poor, we see that it's nine percent in comparison to nineteen percent of Black families in the United States. And there are many things that has allowed this to happen. Um, one really good book that I recommend folks to read is The Color of Law. And this book goes into details of the discriminations that people face, specifically Black people back in the day when they were looking to buy or rent homes in the suburbs. And these deeds was written, were written by the Federal Housing Agency, where they forbid um, these houses to be sold or rented to Black people. And I also want to go into some of the reasons as to why this gap is so large in America. And not surprisingly, slavery. All right, we know slavery happened over 400 years ago, but slavery only ended 150 years ago. All right, and the lasting and daunting effects from slavery has been daunting for some of those communities. Like, think about having a surname that was given to you by your slave masters and not being able to identify who, what your ancestry is past your great great grandparents. They were stripped from their communities, brought over and pretty much built America from the ground up, from picking cottons to building some of the biggest infrastructures here in the United States before slavery ended. So the psychological impact from slavery has lasted in our communities and is ongoing in our communities. Another practice that was done is a, a practice that we call redlining, where there were companies that would actually outline areas um, that has large black populations to warn mortgage lenders to not loan them money. All right, so this was very effective in isolating black people in areas and in and it also would allow for lower levels of investment than their white counterparts. So when we think of equity that you would have built over time by having a mortgage for a house that cost $10,000 $10, um, in the early 1950s or 1930s, that now costs $400,000, right? Black people were prevented from having that type of equity building for their communities. And even today, it's difficult for Black people to receive loans um, for mortgages or even business ventures because we don't have the assets that these lenders look for that they use as a criteria for borrowing money. And we think of inequalities that we face every day, right, from the beginning of slavery to today. <laughs> and we think about how we are constantly not treated equal in different aspects of in our lives. 
Another big one is segregation. And segregation, when you think about it, is pretty much yesterday. I speak with my husband, grandparents who lived through that era, and they talk about how they weren't able to enter certain establishments simply because of the color of their skin. And the ongoing discrimination that the community face. And this goes anywhere from going into a store, it means anything from walking down the block, driving. And I feel like in the community, there's a lot of little things that we encounter that people who are outside of that community don't really understand. Even today, there are laws that are still being passed to allow black women to wear their hair in the way that it grows out of their heads. Just think about that. that we've had for years had to utilize European um, factors or looks in order to be accepted in our workplaces. And so we have a lot of work to do. And I don't think this gap is going to decrease without the help of our allies, um, which in other words, uh, white people. And so I want to zone in on education, because that's something I'm very passionate about. And so I wanna specifically talk about education in New York City. So in my role at Rocky DU, I get to interact and engage with over 2000 students from the New York City public schools a year. And so I interact with students from all different types of schooling, um, all different quality of education. New York City's uh, DOE school system or Department of Education has the largest school district in the United States. We have over a million students um, in our New York City public schools. When we look at the demographics of students in the schools, we see that the majority are from the minoritized communities or Hispanic and Black communities. We have about 15% White and 16% Asian. If we line that up with New York City's demographic, we see that we have about 42% White, 29% Hispanic, and 24% Black. And so we realize that there are a large number of white students that are actually opting to go into private schools, um, which are schools that are not free. And within the demographics of these schools, we have a number of different things that play a role in the education and within the school system. So in the New York City DOE system, we have about 13% that are English language learners. And so these students may be uh, recent immigrants, their parents don't speak English, they're learning English as they go. We also have about 20% of those students in the DOE school system that have some sort of learning disabilities. And when you have learning disabilities, you're usually given an individualized education plan and you have a lot more one-on-one -on -one interaction with your teachers. But not only that, we have a whopping 72% of students in the school system that are economically disadvantaged. And so that means their parents or their families participate participate in some type of government assistant program. That can be something like um, food stamps, social security, and a lot of them are even under the poverty line. And so to get a better understanding of how the school district is run in New York City, I just wanna list out the different types of public schools that they are. So you have the public schools with residence requirements. Um, New York City or, or New York City residents call this uh, zone school. So it's pretty much you go to the school that's in your neighborhood. And so this is for the majority of schooling in um, elementary school and in middle school. Um, New York City has a special system where that the public high schools are open to city are open to children citywide. And so you can go to middle school in Brooklyn and attend a high school in Manhattan. You can attend middle school in the Bronx and attend a high school in Brooklyn. And so usually this process is done through application. So when they reach their eighth grade year, they make a list of several schools that they wanna go into. Um, and each school has their own selection criteria. Um, it's based usually based on grades and behavior, but if you don't match on any of those schools on your list, you're usually sent to your zone school. And for many students that are in the disadvantaged communities, that's not necessarily a great thing because we know the quality of the education is not as great as schools in other districts. Um, we also have charter schools, which is a hybrid of private and public schools, um, but they're free, uh, but they're independently run 
um, public schools, which means that they're not ran by the state of New York. So they have the ability to bring about new ideas and curricula that they think fits uh, the student group in their schools. And then lastly, you have specialized public high schools. And these high schools require um, admissions through a specialized high school admissions test. And these tests are usually for students that want to participate in a specific program. Out of, I think, eight or nine specialized high schools in New York City, there are um, specialized high schools that specialize in the performing arts, but there are also specialized high schools that um, have programs in STEM. And these schools are known to be amazing schools. They have great resources. But in 2019, data came out that showed that despite the fact that there are about 70% of New York City students that are Black and Hispanic, less than 10% actually get admissions into these schools. And just to bear in mind that I mentioned, education is one of the determinant factors for someone's socioeconomic status. And usually when you get into some of these specialized schools, a lot of them get acceptance into Ivy League institutions. You have people actually coming out to recruit from these schools. These schools have amazing resources. They have their own science labs. They have the additional monies that they get from alumni that allows them to have a higher spending budget. And what's also shocking is that a lot of students that attend these schools aren't even coming from public middle schools in New York City. A lot of them are coming from private middle schools or from backgrounds with parents who can afford to provide them tutors and allow for um, preparing them for the specialized test to get into these schools. So even at this viewpoint, you see that the disparities are rising in terms of the quality of education a lot of these students are having in New York City. And this was all pre-COVID. Another issue that the schools in New York City had pre-pandemic is the issue of overcrowding. And so there are actually more than 300 students in New York City that are crammed in classes of more than 30 or more. And granted, uh, uh, officials know that it's a problem. They have put out several proposals. They have a budget to try to increase the number of schools in New York City, but we can't hide the fact that this is a problem and it's more a problem in neighborhoods that are disadvantaged. And here I'm just showing the different areas in New York City. So we have Manhattan, the Bronx, the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. And we have schools that can go up to about 70% that's um, of the students that are in overcrowded classes. And so alongside the disparities in terms of the quality of education a lot of these students are getting and the overcrowding that they're seeing in the schools, many of these schools actually had poor or no ventilation systems in their buildings. Classes that did not have windows for airflow these classes already had low resources that they would need for adequate safety supplies. I've heard from teachers myself complaining that if they did not have the budget to put hand soap in the bath bathroom prior to the pandemic, how are they gonna find the budget to do so during a pandemic? And like I mentioned, the overcrowding where we have a large number of students in the classroom, it makes it really hard for engagement with the students, um, with the teachers. And so, like we know, the pandemic came around um, around January, February. In about March, middle of March, uh, New York City decided to shut schools down. We all entered quarantine and everyone had to transition to virtual learning. And I wanna say that the pandemic has been hard on everyone, right? Despite your race, despite your, despite your ethnicity, despite your socioeconomic status. It's been hard on parents, it's been hard on teachers, it's been hard on students. But in the middle of the pandemic, we have these communities that have been hit even harder than people who don't have the same situations that they're in. And so these schools were abruptly closed. These students had to finish out the year virtually. And many of them had difficulties trying to manage virtual learning in their spaces. So let's talk a little bit about how this virtual learning has affected some of these students. One of the data sets that I found was really shocking that there are a number of households in New York City that don't have reliable internet. And this was something I did not think about even as a black person because my socioeconomic status is different in terms of 
um, middle income class. Right. And so when I come home, my Wi-Fi automatically connects. My phone is always on me. Apparently, we all know that online learning requires reliable Internet. And even now with our Internet services, you know that it's not necessarily reliable. But a whopping 150,000 New York City households did not have Internet prior to the pandemic. And there have been a lot of grassroots organizations that has been working to aid in this problem. And more than 100,000 of those households had school age children between the age of five and 17. But not only was internet an issue, a lot of these students, about 80,000 lack a device to learn at home. And what the DOE had done was loan out about 300,000 internet enabled iPad. But as we all know, iPads can be very difficult to navigate, right? I have a computer and an iPad and it's very frustrating at times to use certain programs on my iPad in comparison to my laptop. And then I think about some of the households that need multiple devices for the children that they have. And so if you're a family of five and you have three kids and you are also working from home, I can't even imagine um, the disparities in terms of being able to have a decent device in order to do virtual learning or your work from home. Another issue that we face is that these students that have uh, learning disabilities were now having to choose which individualized education plan they was going to get. And so there weren't enough teachers to provide one-on-one -on -one learning virtually. Um, the parents can't afford tu tutors that they would need to make sure that their kids stay on track. And so you had to pick and choose what subjects were more important for your child to do during the virtual learning. And also thinking about New York City living. Um, a lot of people in New York City live in apartment buildings. And I think about even some of the students that I've mentored, they're in a one, two bedroom apartment with um, multi-generations, right? So they have their grandparents with them. They have several siblings. And so during the pandemic, we also had our research program for students in underserved communities. And it would be difficult for them to find a space that they felt comfortable in their homes to navigate the e-learning environment. And what really hurt the most for me, because I have friends and family that were going through this, is that these parents, a lot of them still had to go to work. Even when things shut down, a lot of them were known as essential workers, right? They're nurses, their LPNs, their CNAs, they work for the city. I had friends that work for ACS, which is child services, and their work could not continue at home. So they had to find ways and decide whether or not their jobs were important or their child's education was important, right? So you think about the lack of supervision that they may have. And even though parents decided to keep their kids home with their grandparents, it was very hard for them to help them navigate um, the e-learning lifestyle. Another issue that we saw was that over 300,000 New York City children have food insecurities. And imagining that these students, when they went to school, they knew that they were getting breakfast, they knew that they were getting lunch. When school shut down, they now had to figure out where their next meals were coming from. What New York City did do was that they did provide hubs where students can go to, they had different schools that were set as food hubs where they can go and get their meals and take them home with them. But even through that and during the pandemic, they served parents and about 30% of them said that they still had to skip meals or reduce the number of meals as a result of the pandemic. And even thinking about myself at home with my family during the pandemic, my grocery bill went through the roof. So I can't even imagine what it must have been like for families who have multiple school age children in their homes. And another issue that they faced was that the students that were English language learners, they may not have the, um, the parents may not have the ability or the proficiency to navigate the technology um, with their students. So there are a lot of problems that uh, New York City students face during the pandemic. And also thinking about within the school district, you have over 70% that are economically disadvantaged. And to think about the majority of them has faced one, many, or all of these issues during COVID. So there are definitely more problems than solutions for the school year, but I know that 
you know, now we're trying to think about hybrid learning, but the problem is a lot of parents actually fear their kids going into schools for in-person learning. And that fear is valid. They surveyed about 800 parents and they show when you compare white parents and black parents, and they ask them if their child would attend school in person, if possible. In New York City, 84% of white parents said that they will send their child back to school. And 34% of black parents said that they will not send their child or that they will send their child to school, All right? So you have about a 50% difference in not only you know, the parents deciding that education in person is better, but you found that the black parents were actually scared because they knew that they were at higher risk for uh, contracting COVID and dying from COVID. So with these parents, what they did, they asked them, why will your child not attend in person? The number one fear, of course, was coronavirus. They did not trust city officials to make sure that the schools were safe for their kids. And they made the decision to say like, we're gonna just have to scrap the school year because the health of my family is more important. And when we think about these families who have grandparents living with them, you can understand why they feel this way. And so some of the quotes from these parents who took the survey, you had a black parent with a household income of under 50,000 that mentioned that her child would not attend school in person due to the risk of him contracting COVID and bringing it home. Um, a Latinx parent mentioned that yes, they know school is important, but their family and their child's well-being and health is even more important. And another black parent with an income greater than 50,000 mentioned that it is unsafe for my child to be in school around other children and adults where they don't feel that the safety measures are in place to prevent the spread of the virus. And this is not just something that I'm talking about from my experience, but there are other researchers that have been putting forth uh, theories and hypotheses of what's gonna happen after the pandemic ends and what's gonna happen with these students in these low socioeconomic uh, households and those students who have um, disadvantaged backgrounds. And so some of the quotes from these papers where they mentioned that the health crisis can become a social crisis and will have long lasting consequences for children in low income families. Another page, peer peer mentioned that is likely for students in low income backgrounds to be more adversely affected than children from high income backgrounds. And another one stating that the closures that are resulting can damage children's social, psychological and educational development, as well as lost income and productivity in adults who cannot work because of childcare responsibilities. And I'm saying all of this not to say that I am for or against virtual learning or in-person learning. I'm just putting this out there to show that this decision is not an easy one for many parents, but it's an even harder one for parents from disadvantaged households. But let's switch gears a little and talk about health. Now there's one thing I wanna point out before I talk about health disparities. There is no genetic basis for racial health disparities that we see. For the most part, the racial health disparities that we see is strictly because of systemic racism and white privilege. What is white privilege? It's this unearned advantage based on race and it can be observed both systematically and individually. And we know this by experience, there's a lot of data on it. I know this from my personal experience and experience from others within my community that look like myself. And so what brings about these health disparities? Number one, discrimination. All right, and I think this is a big thing and I've heard about this many times where, you know, if you're a person of color and you go into a hospital to get care, you are disregarded, right? There's a lot of studies that have been done back in the day when science was pretty much run by white men where they're looking at eugenics and they thought that black people can actually take on more pain than their white counterparts, right? So when a black person goes into a hospital and complain for the pain, they are not regarded the same as their white counterparts. And I've experienced that personally. 
right? Healthcare access and utilization. We know that a lot of these hospitals and clinics in underserved areas do not give as good healthcare as those in affluent areas, right? When we think about some of these um, underserved, people from underserved communities who may have lost their jobs and now don't have health healthcare, right? We think about immigrants who are here in the US and also don't have healthcare. Right, occupation. And I think by now many people know that a lot of people in Black and Indigenous people of color community have jobs that are people facing, right? Especially during coronavirus. My husband, he's considered an essential worker. He works for the MTA, which is the transit authority in New York City, and he's a train operator. In his job alone, they have been 130 deaths from COVID in just the MTA. And when you look at how many have been infected, when they look at the MTA workers versus hospital workers, they actually had higher rates of infection, right? These are people who can't work from home and they had no option but to go into work, right? The health disparities also come from education, income and wealth gaps, which I talked about briefly. And it also has to do with housing. Where you live is very important with the type of healthcare that you're gonna receive. But we also know that location of where a lot of these urban communities are has shown increased things like asthma rates and diabetes, like I'll show in the other slide, right? This is a slide that um, I've gotten data from I think the end of April. And so it just shows some of the leading comorbidities for COVID deaths in New York, right? But this has been seen across the US. Diabetes, obesity, asthma, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. All of these diseases you see at much higher rates in social, certain ethnic and racial groups. And that's not because of any genetic components. It's because of their socioeconomic status and the disparities that we see because of that. And we see that hypertension was one of the leading causes. And of course, as data came in, we knew that some of these things have gotten lower or higher, but we know for sure diabetes is a player, um, a lower immune system is a player, heart disease is a player, lung disease is a player in higher comorbidity um, in terms of COVID death. Now, if we were to look at COVID rates, debt rates by age and race, you can see that along the line, consistently, Blacks are dying at much higher rates than any of the other racial ethnic groups, right? And that rate drastically increases the older you get, but it's the same from the youngest to the oldest. And this is data um, as of September 20th that also showcases the same thing. When we look at the population and we compare that with their share in deaths and cases, as you can see, whites make up about 60% of the population in the US. Um, they have about 50% in their share of death and 44% in their share of cases. When we look at blacks, they make up about 12% of the US population but they contribute to 21% of COVID deaths, 18% of uh, COVID infections. And you see a similar uh, trend with Hispanics communities. And so what do these disparities look like in New York City? And so this is data from the New York City Department of Health. And we see the same trend, right? Is that you have cases that look similar but when we start looking at hospitalization of people who have severe COVID cases, you see that the disparities become wider. And you see that whites and Hispanics are, have drastically increased rates of hospitalization. And this is per 100,000. Um, and so these numbers are 600 per 100,000 and 800 per 100,000. Um, you see the same thing when you look at deaths, right? deaths in Black and African Americans and Hispanic communities are almost double of what you see in other racial and ethnic group. This is not just in New York City, right? This is something that has been happening throughout the US. And this is data from the CDC that highlights the COVID cases, hospitalization, and deaths by race and ethnicity. And you can see American Indian or indigenous people, Alaska Native um, of non-Hispanic 
uh, dissent, they have 1.8 higher times the case than they see with Asian non-Hispanics people, right? And you see, and this is in comparison to white non-Hispanics, right? You see 1.4 times more of cases in black um, or African-American people, and you see 1.75 more cases. In hospitalization, you see the trend as well, and that's the same trend that you see, right? And race and ethnicity has now become a risk marker, but not because of a genetic component. Right? These are because of the different disparities that we see in your socioeconomic status, your access to health care, your exposure to your virus based on your occupation. Right? We think about the frontline workers, we think about the essential workers, people who work in the grocery store. Right? We, we praise them as essential workers, but they're not getting paid enough to die from COVID because they have no other way to make ends meet at work. And I also, before I, and I wanna also talk about, you know, even though black people have gotten to a point where they feel that they're middle and upper class, that does not excuse them from also dying from COVID-19. And I don't know if you heard, but Dr. Susan Moore, she's a physician, right? The only thing that's different from her and her counterparts is her skin color. And she went in because she contracted COVID she made a video talking about the racist treatment that she was receiving. And the doctors made it seem that she was a drug addict. The white doctors were downplaying her complaints of pain and told her that she could be discharged. They sent her home. Two weeks later, Dr. Susan Moore died of COVID-19. And this is not just something that happens with anyone. I've experienced this myself when I was pregnant and I went to my doctor and I told him I had pain and the nurse was dismissing my complaints for pain. And it wasn't because, it was only because I advocated for myself that I went in and I made sure that I was not leaving that room until my doctor saw me and they found out what the reason for that pain was, right? When black people go to get treated I'm sorry. When black people go to the hospital and get treated, we have to make sure that we have people that can advocate for us, that can make sure that we be treated fairly and we're not discriminated against. With all this said, where do we go from from here? So at my role at Rocky DU, and our role at Rocky DU, so we're the science outreach program. One thing that we're passionate about is that we wanna make sure that we promote interest and confidence in STEM for everyone. This is not a white field. This is not a field for people of a specific descent. This is a field that affects everyone from the time you discover, make a discovery in the lab to the time that you put it out in market, right? And the disparities that we're seeing has now been caused daunting effects on our communities. The conspiracy theories that are going around in our communities because we don't have the trust that we need to have because of historic events. We need to make sure that we have equitable access for all groups. Everyone needs to have equal opportunities in STEM. Everyone needs to have equal opportunities in any field that they decide that they wanna go into. When they're in those fields, you make sure that they feel included. I hate that a lot of companies and organizations focus on numbers. And when you get these numbers and you get the number of black people that you need or indigenous people that you need, that's it. You don't worry about how comfortable they feel. You don't worry about whether or not they feel included. And you wonder why they don't stay. Right? With our mission and our goal, we're hoping that if we work on making sure that everyone has equal access and everyone feels included, you will gradually see diversity. And I think this is something people can take with them um, through their jobs and through their um, lives. And not just at Rocky DU, but our team works really hard talking about how we can promote equity and access in STEM. So this is a member of my team, Desan Davis, and here are our team members. And we are within a number of different groups. We're in a New York City um, 
Science Research Consortium, Science Research Mentoring Consortium, and we have about 20 programs that are similar to us, and we all have the same goal in mind. We're also part of a larger community, STEM Ecosystems. This is about 90 communities across the globe, and we're all working to make sure that we can improve STEM learning. What can you do, right? This is me talking, right? But I'm tired of Black people having to be the one to say that there is a problem. And I think 2020, if anything, has highlighted how bad the problem is. I need you to use your white privilege. Become an ally for Black people and Black Indigenous people of color. If they say that a problem exists, you are not in their bubbles. You are not in their communities. If you don't have to think twice about walking into an establishment and feel that you're being watched a certain way, you do not understand the traumas that Black people face. Showcase compassion and empathy. Education, there's so many material out there. There's so many books that you can read to understand what these groups are going through, to understand the constant pain and heartache that we are going through. Support and donate to grassroots organizations. There are many organizations that are working hard to close this gap, this ridiculous gap that we're seeing in the United States. And I need you to think about those that are coming behind of you. Have a dialogue with people who don't look like you. Don't go to them when something happens. Wait till they come to you and tell you what's going on. But when they do tell you, you need to listen. You have the voice. Use that voice. Right? When we think about who actually are still in power in the US, honestly, it's still white men, right? Minorities cannot continue to go to the forefront talking about the disparities that they face if white people don't go to their other white friends and let them understand how they are feeling and make sure that they're making a space that's comfortable for all people to come into. Think about your kids. And I think about my black son when he grows up and I want to make sure that whoever he interacts with would treat him the same right? That his skin color will not matter when he walks into a store. His skin color will not matter when he's driving. And just for you to highlight, if yesterday was not anything, when we think about what happened yesterday, 52 people were arrested yesterday. There were 289 people that were booked in one day of a Black Lives Matter protest. And somehow we had white supremacists walk into the Capitol building and not one cop we saw fight them. And during every Black Lives Matter protest, you see that cops are there with their tear gas and their guns and their armor. And I, I'm so sorry that I'm getting emotional, but I, I just really want you all to understand that we are not talking to talk. We are talking because these are the experiences that we face. Thank you. Oh, Dallas, thank you so much. Let me, thank you, honey. You gonna have me over here boo-hooing so with all that, right? No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. You have done what we in the community say you have spoken a whole word. Okay, because it, now maybe I, I take this very personally, uh, but I have experienced uh, the things that you talked about. You know, I, I drive out of my neighborhood to go get medical care because I don't believe I'll get me good medical care here. I drive out of my neighborhood to go grocery shopping you know, and I'm from a, a different or a slightly higher, you know, uh, uh, socioeconomic status. And I, and that allows me to do those things. Mm -hmm. So you, you build that case of, you just add all that together. It's this snowball effect of, well, no wonder COVID 
affected our communities, uh, our community uh, in, a, in a more adverse way. Um, we, you mentioned a book and I wanna go back to that, The Color of Law. You, you recommended that and someone had asked who the author was and that is Richard Rothstein. Um, if, if anyone is interested in indeed um, looking up that book, there's so many things that you, you mentioned. Um, I, I cannot even imagine not having something that seems so basic to me as internet access. <laughs> I lo Girl, my, my internet went down for two hours last <laughs> month and you would have thought. <laughs> And I, I really had to get myself together and walk away. I'm like, it's two hours and they let me know there was gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, what if this was on the regular, this was my life and I had kids and I had, you know, I mean, I do live in a multi-generational household, which, you know, I, how many people think about what that means? I have a senior in here. So now I'm just not, you know, living for me. I got to think about my travels, where I go, what I do and what I bring home. Exactly. That was a shocking, you, you, you said there were quite a things that surprised you. I cannot believe that the MTA had a high, has a higher infection rate than medical uh, personnel. But then I thought about it, may, is it maybe because of their access or lack of access to proper PPE? Is yep, that that's exactly what it was. And okay. so in the beginning of the pandemic, all of the PPE were sent to, and you know, of course it makes sense, right? But you know, you think about that they don't have the option, right, to stay home. Luckily oh. for my husband, he broke his toe. Well, unluckily, Ooh, luckily. Luck, girl, you, 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 I know you got a hammer and you hit that man in his foot. <laughs> that is what you did. You said, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he broke his toe. So he was home for like three weeks during like the height of the pandemic. But while he was okay. going to work, we were like, you know, you have to take off your clothes by the mudroom, make sure you wash your hands. You know, here is like something to put over your face. Make sure you're wearing that at all times. Um, but yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. Very, very, very stressful. Um, we do have some some questions here and I do want to get to as many uh, before the, the end of the hour. Um, now, I, I too, as a native New Yorker, this question popped up and I will honor it um, from Pamela. She said, wait a New York minute. Uh, what about <laughs> when you said you got to go below 96th Street? Um, she said, well, what about Columbia Barnard at 116th Street? Like she's, she's getting into the map with you. <laughs> there are a few good uh, institutions above 96th Street, but for the majority. Um, so if you think about like Presbyterian and NYU, those are usually the, the institutions that people go to. There are like spots of like mm -hmm. really good ones in those areas, but the majority are below 96th Street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think I hit the cutoff. I'm like, right, I go right to Mount Sinai and it's like, ah, 98th Street. I'm close. I'm so close. <laughs> um, Matthew had a question I, and I may think you might even have answered it. Um, he said that I've read that, that Black Americans are suffering at a higher rate of death relative to infection rate. Um, and is that true? And if so, what are the factors? Are, is, are they infected at a higher rate due to occupation? for example, and, and why is that death rate higher? And you did sort of answer that, you know, because mm -hmm. socioeconomic and, 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 you know, some of those jobs, like, like you can't drive the E-train from your, from your house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but also it's because uh, when Black people become infected and we think about healthcare access, right, and whether or not they have insurance, and the mistrust that we have, like, let's be real, racism exists in our healthcare. And so a lot of black people would try to figure out some way to fix themselves before they decide to go to the hospital to get help. And when they do go to the hospital to get help, they're not seen as important as their other counterparts. Um, so it's a slew of num a number of different things in terms of the health insurance, if they have health insurance, whether or not, how soon they're going to seek help um, and the trust that they have in the institution, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I... Uh... I, I learned about, I mean, I advocated for myself, you know, with my own health care, but I learned how important that was um, when taking care of elderly parents, you know, when they can no longer advocate for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. that you step in and it, 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 I really felt like a mama bear and it really is this, no, no, what, what is this medication and why are we doing this? And he says, this hurts. Why aren't you listening? You know, so I feel I like, I, so I, like I got into the boxing ring. It's like, no, you're going to help my old man. <laughs> 
Yeah, that was me when my dad was sick. He was in Miami. And every time he had a doctor's appointment, I was like, you have to let me know. And I am flying and I need to speak with the doctor and I need his phone number and I need every single update. Um, But yeah, I think it's super important for us to have advocates for us. Um, And they don't necessarily have to be black like us. They can be white. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think this affects all households but then you put in that extra cultural component mm-hmm. and it it just you know cultural and social economic and it makes a difficult situation even harder um mm-hmm. so yeah no thank you for for talking about that and bringing light to that um Nirav had a question and i hope i'm saying your name correctly um and uh, they asked that when you're comparing the willingness to send kids to school Okay, given, uh, you know, the safety of was a stated issue. Is there any research, research about how safe kids would be staying home? Um, I don't know of any research. I'm just thinking about other folks that I've encountered who's had to, who've had to stay home. Um, and so, for example, one of the programs that I manage at Rocky D, we bring in about 16 students from the underserved community, and we usually bring them into our labs and we went virtual. And we spoke with them and I think, I wanna say like 95% of them were black or Hispanic. And we asked them during the program, like, hey, have you been out? You know, have you gone to the grocery store? Have you went outside? And the majority of them, their parents would not let them leave their house. Like this is how scared they were. Like they would send one person to the grocery store. They would put the groceries outside, they would wait. And then they would bring it back in. So this was like at the height of the pandemic when we still ha- didn't really have an idea of like how COVID-19 infection works. And we found out, my, me and my coworkers were shocked, like, wow, you have not even gone to the park. <laughs> Their parents were so scared. And so I think, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're thinking about safety in terms of like interaction with other people, they probably were safer at home because they, their parents weren't let them get out. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I am sure that uh, the year that was 2020, I don't know if we're allowed to speak of it again, or the, the pandemic in general, the, the research has only just begun. You know, this is, this is I, I, I guess, a treasure trove for, for every sort of scientist to, yeah. to do these studies and, and figure out what these effects were and what they will be um, going, going forward. Um, uh, Ruth Walker, thank you for posting this. I don't know if other people can see this. She posted that there are extensive excerpts of Color of Law, and she gave the um, uh, a link. And also, of course, you know you can you can get it at the library. I looked it up very quickly, and there's an audio. The audio is how I get my information. Yes. <laughs> so I want to thank you for that um, uh, 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 that uh, reference. And uh, there. I know we are, we are at the hour and I, I, I want to thank you again. And I have a couple of people in here um, who I always tell them to ask their question in the form of a question um, and no statements, but I, I think that's necessary to change today. Um, I had a couple of people in here who said there is no need to apologize when you are delivering a powerful message so sincerely. Um, and and I, 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 totally, I totally agree with that. Um, thank you, uh, Matthew, for saying that. And uh, Tanisha uh, said that uh, she does not have a question. Uh, <laughs> she's just, you know, letting you know that she is so, so, so proud of you. And thank, thank you for this discussion, for being genuine and speaking these harsh but necessary truths. Uh, those of us who know, just know, and it's great to finally hear our voices and our struggles heard and amplified. Progress is the goal onward. Yeah. So I thought you needed to hear that. I needed to read that, <laughs> um, you know, because we we you, you spoke about that we need we need allies, but more than allies, we need advocacy and compassion. And I love you did this at Nexus, and I'm glad that you did it here when you said, okay, here's what's up, and here's what we're doing about it. You're giving people actionable steps to go how we move forward and it always feels like moving forward is in baby steps but I don't care if it's baby steps it's steps it's steps <laughs> I agree you know which, which yes reminds me I didn't get my actual Fitbit steps in today but that's okay that's not what this is about it didn't either my Apple watch just told me it's like hey you haven't been moving today <laughs> oh, listen, I had to take my Apple watch off my Apple watch was trying to run my life it said hey you've been sitting down too long I'm like that's none of your business Apple <laughs> But listen, I don't, I don't want to hold you too long past your time. And I, I really appreciate 
um, again, your thank you for coming here. Thank you yeah. for the information. Um, I love that you opened up with, you know, what did, what did you say? This, this here, here, here's who I am and here's my bubble. You know, that's, that's just so straight and so <laughs> honest. I might, I'm, I might yeah. do that myself now. So <laughs> I don't know where I'm coming from. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but that was definitely appreciated. Thank you for your, your time and your talent and your expertise. And I want to remind everybody that I hope I see you back here on the January 21st. Uh, we are going to be welcoming uh, Maria Konnikova, and she's discussing her book, uh, The Biggest Bluff, uh, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Uh, I, of course, want to say thank you to Skeptical Inquirer, to, to CFI, uh, the Center for Inquiry, and, of course, my tech team, the amazing Mark. And everybody, my name is Leanne Lord. Uh, thank you, and good night. Thanks, Aldalas. Good night, sweetie. Bye.